Hello, NaNoWriMo. I am Grant Faulkner, Executive Director of National Novel Writing Month, and thank you so much for joining us for You've written your novel, what's next? Uh, this is very generously, this webcast is very generously sponsored by our good sponsor, Kindle Direct Publishing, which has sponsored us for several years in a row and, and helped us put on NaNoWriMo, so special thanks to them. And you know, this is the perfect question for this time of year. Um, a lot of people have now given their nano novels a, a month or two or three months rest um, and are either beginning revision or getting ready to revise. And you know, one of the things I hear uh, most frequently from NaNoWriMo writers is, you know, after November, they want to finish that novel, and many of them want to publish that novel. But those are big, you know, thorny, labyrinthian processes that are very daunting and intimidating, especially for a first timer, I think. Um, and so we're very lucky to have um, some great authors here, three great authors, uh, Denise Grover Swank, CJ Lyons, and Neil Thompson. And they're going to talk, you know, I, I think it's best to hear these things, not from publishers or editors or agents, but actually from, from people who've experienced it from the beginning of the rough draft to the final product and, and, and go through all of those, those decisions and, and steps. So thank you for joining us, um, everyone. Uh, before I do intros, just wanted to do, um, let the viewers know this uh, webcast is about the first 30 minutes of or so of it or so. Um, Neil's going to interview Denise and CJ. And then uh, the last 30 minutes, we will take your questions, many of which are already queued up here. But if you haven't a uh, asked a question, just go below uh, the screen here and you'll see a, a, a section called Viewer Questions and Suggestions. And just put your, uh, your questions in there and submit it. And we will queue these up and try to answer as many of them as possible. Um, but uh, so thanks so much for joining us. This is this is always a treat, and uh, I, people I know in the viewer chat window are always swapping their own tips, so that's great as well. Uh, so Denise, thank you so much for joining us. Denise is a NaNoWriMo yes. writer and and a winner, right? Did you win? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, great. yeah, I won. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I totally won. Okay, good. I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't sure if you hit the 50,000 words, but she started <laughs> writing her novel way before NaNoWriMo. Yeah, she wrote her first novel. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Good. You kicked it. Um, but Denise started her first novel in fourth <laughs> yeah. grade. And um, she, but she rediscovered her, her love of writing when she started her blog, There's Always Room for One More. And then in 2009, she realized she wasn't getting any younger, like many of us. And... Uh, so it was now or never. She 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 dove in and she did NaNoWriMo, and she was off and running with that 69,000 word novel. Um, she's a New York Times and five times USA Today bestseller, and she's the author of multiple series, including the Rose Gardner mystery series, the Wedding Pack series, Off the Subject series, and Chosen series. So she's very prolific. That 69,000 words has really gone way beyond that. Uh, she has six children, three dogs, and an overactive imagination, which fuels her passion for reading and writing. Wow. I don't know how to do all that. Uh, CJ has been a storyteller <laughs> all of her life. Good, just like you and you and Denise can swap early early childhood stories. Um, and she's always created stories about people discovering the courage to make a difference. So that's a really interesting theme. She's a former pediatric ER doctor, has lived the life she writes about in her cutting edge thrillers with heart. Um, and is a New York Times and USA Today best-selling author of 29 novels. And one of those 29 novels, the cover of, of it is right behind uh, CJ. So maybe <laughs> you can you can Google, Google it online or CJ can give us a close-up later. Um, CJ has taught numerous live and online workshops and one of her favorite endeavors has been coaching writers through NaNoWriMo. So she knows this subject well. Her novels have won the International Thriller Writers Prestigious Thriller Award the RT Reviewer's Choice Award, Golden Gateway, Reader's Choice Award, and the RT Seal of Excellence. So thanks so much for joining us, Denise and CJ. And before Neil jumps in and starts asking some fascinating questions, um, Neil is also a, a writer as well. Uh, he specializes in narrative nonfiction, biography, and overlooked Americana. Uh, his fourth book, A Curious Man, chronicles the hard-to-believe life of the eccentric world-traveling cartoonist, media pioneer, Millionaire celebrity playboy Robert, believe it or not, Ripley, considered to be the godfather of reality TV. You've got to read that one. Uh, Neil's a former journalist. He's worked for such publications as the Philadelphia Inquirer, the St. Petersburg Times, and the Baltimore Sun, and he's written for publications like Outside Magazine, Esquire, Sports Illustrated, and Men's Health. 
Um, he, since 2011, he has worked as an editor, reviewer, and interviewer on the books team at Amazon.com, where he oversees the Best Books of the Month program. He also oversees Amazon's um, uh, literary philanthropic program, and has been a, which has been a generous do donor to National Novel Writing Month. So thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, I'm going to pop back in about halfway through the webcast to, to talk through some of these uh, questions from participants, but I'm going to hand it over to you now. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks a lot, Grant. Thanks for the kind intros. Super excited to be here with CJ and Denise. Um, thank you so much for, for being a part of this. Thanks to Nano for, for hosting it and for setting things up. It's a, it's a super community, and uh, I'm happy to have uh, a lot of the viewers who uh, have won Nano or at least participated in Nano to be, uh, to be joining us today. Um, so it's great to be here with CJ and Denise, both of them wonderful storytellers, both of them devoted to their readers. Great backstories as authors, and we'll talk a little bit about how they got to the point that they're at now. Um, and I think, too, uh, what's, what's going to be fun for the viewers today is to, to learn from these two uh, authors who I consider kind of inspiring examples of the new breed of, of author entrepreneur. Um, you know, people who are doing the writing, but also doing the hard work of getting their, their stories out there, connecting with readers. Um, and I think in, in both cases, Denise and, and CJ, you're both doing what you love, um, and, and you're both doing it because you believe in the power of storytelling. Um, and I think that's why a lot of us are here. We just love a great story. Um, so before we get to some of the questions, I wanted to share two fun facts to uh, top off um, Grant's uh, uh, introduction to each of these authors. One is for CJ. Um, Grant mentioned that she spent 17 years as an ER doctor. During that time, she has faced down gangbangers, drunks twice her size, and walked away from not one but two hard landings in a medevac helicopter. <laughs> so um, CJ has really, truly lived uh, the life that she writes about in her Thrillers with Heart stories. Yeah, just don't uh, tell my mother case. about the helicopter. <laughs> you didn't tell your mother about that? Oh, if she's watching, no. sorry. <laughs> um, and then Denise's fun <laughs> fact. In, in addition to raising six kids, which I find hard to believe, I can barely keep up with my two, um, one of her hidden talents is the ability to drink massive amounts of caffeine and then fall asleep within two minutes. That's impressive. Um, oh, yeah. So, with that... <laughs> it's called sli major let's... sleep deprivation. <laughs> <laughs> That's what six kids will do to you, right? <laughs> so, so let's jump in with some, uh, yeah. some questions. <laughs> Um, and and I, I'm, I'm really hoping that the folks who are joining us here, first of all, thank you, thank you guys for being here. I hope this is helpful for your writing. Um, and for those who have finished, uh, uh, who were winners at NaNoWriMo, congratulations. Give yourself a, a virtual hand. Um, so let's jump in with some questions. Uh, since we're being sponsored by uh, NaNoWriMo, let's start off with talking a little bit about that. Both uh, you, CJ, and Denise um, have a, a kinship, I guess you could call it, with NaNoWriMo. Um, CJ, why don't we start with you and talk a little bit about you, your, your connection to NaNoWriMo and how you've uh, worked with NaNoWriMo in the past. Well, I actually have never signed up and been an official participant in it, basically because um, as soon as I began writing as a career with deadlines, um, I just never had a deadline that, you know, happened to be timed right with NaNoWriMo to, to act as a participant. But uh, what I've done is coached several people through it. Um, I've given um, some workshops um, that were added bonuses, incentives for people to win, as well as uh, contributed some articles and resources to help people during their nano ramp. Um, and I think the, the cool thing about it is the gamification. So you set up this sense of community, but you don't feel like you're competing against each other uh, as much as you're a team competing together to all complete this wonderful challenge. So I, I love that aspect of it. Did you guys get that? Great. Denise, you want to tell us your story of getting started with NaNoWriMo? And... 
Maybe maybe uh, with an eye toward uh, uh, yeah the first the, I heard of it. Topic. What's next? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, um, I heard about NaNoWriMo in 2009. I think it was September of 2009. And I had started, um, Grant had said I started my first book in fourth grade. But it was the first of many I never finished. And so um, in September of 2009, I heard about NaNoWriMo. And I told myself, either write a book or shut up about it. Because I always considered myself an author, but I'd never finished a book. So I plotted it out and uh, started November 1st, and on November 30th, I had 69,000 words and then finished the book on December 10th and um, read it a week later and realized it was utter garbage. <laughs> but you know what? That's okay because it was the first book. It was, it was the one that got me started, and once I got started, I couldn't stop. I think I've written uh, 24 books now since November of 2009, and um, uh, that first one never was published. How many books since 2009? I think I've written 24 books. I've lo I lose count. I just finished two, uh, like within the last few weeks. And I've written probably 10 novellas and some short stories. And yeah, so <laughs> I write about six books a year now. Really impressive. That's, that's, in, that's beyond prolific. And that, and that, and it was all NaNoWriMo. Yeah, NaNoWriMo is what did it. So it looks like <laughs> well, one thing I love looks... about NaNoWriMo is it makes writing a habit. Right. Um, hey, I'm back. Okay, back. <laughs> hey, we lost you for a minute. Hey, back. Um, so let's let's um, because of the the focus of today is sort of what's next. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, in your cases, you both um, published uh, independently through KDP. Um, and I guess I'd like to, to start out getting uh, each of your takes on um, why you chose indie publishing, what your, your initial experience was with KDP, and then any advice you might want to offer to those who are trying to figure out what to do next with their completed novels. You want to start, CJ? Um, well, I was, yeah, I was originally traditionally published through Penguin Putnam, and they were putting out my books one book a year, and it was a series, and I had already written uh, four of the books. So after my first book, I was getting all this fan mail saying, we want more, we want them faster, and my first book came out in 2008. So in 2009, after my second book came out, and I was still getting these letters from fans, and my editor and publisher refused to put the books out sooner, um, I read about KDP. It was brand new, and I thought, well, I actually had some other novels that had been sold to traditional publishers and had made it through copy edits and page proofs, but for a variety of reasons, never actually made it into the bookstore. So they met the bar of quality for New York City. They were ready to go to press. And so I thought, why not share these with my audience? So I thought of it more as a marketing um, tool, because I don't do a lot of marketing, so this is one thing I could do pretty easily, as well as a way to reach my audience and keep my name kind of in front of their mind by the time my next book uh, that was traditionally published came out. And I did that. Um, I had several books up by January 2010, and that's when the Haiti earthquake hit. And so I said, I just sent out a newsletter uh, to my fans, and I said, hey, I'm going to donate all the proceeds for February uh, from my Kindle sales, because Kindle was the only game in town back then, uh, to Doctors Without Borders. And we sold over 2,000 books that month, which at that time, 2010, was a phenomenal amount. And so within a year of starting to self-publish, I was paying the bills with the self-publishing, and within 18 months, I was making literally what I would make from New York City publishing in a month, or in a year, I was making that in a month self-publishing. And that's when um, Blind Faith hit. It debuted at number two on the New York Times um, bestseller list. It stayed there for seven weeks. It sold like 250,000 copies in a month or so. Um, I just realized how quickly you could scale up using these tools compared to how slow traditional publishing is. Now, traditional publishing still has a lot of added value. So 
So you have to decide what works best for you and for your readers and for your audience and for your career plan. But for me, working with Kindle uh, was amazing. It was really a life changer and a career changer. That's great. Denise, how about yourself? Your sort of route to KDP and how it's part of your uh, yeah. writing experience now. I never intended to self-publish. In 2009 and 2010, it was still considered vanity publishing. Uh, I intended to traditionally publish, and I was. I everyone said if you self-publish, you could kiss your career in New York goodbye. But I, I had written three books by May of 2010, and I tried to get an agent with all three. And I kept hearing, well, two of them. I heard we love the story. Um, we love the writing, but we don't think we can sell it, or I have a client with a similar project. And the only one that nobody seemed interested in was my mystery, 28 and a Half Wishes, and my beta readers had absolutely loved it. So I decided to take a risk. I was really scary because I didn't know if I was kissing my career goodbye, <laughs> and I uploaded um, 28 and a Half Wishes after a copy editor and got a cover designer and... Um, uploaded it to uh, KDP at the end of June of 2011 and my goal was to sell a thousand books to me that was that was the 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 sign that I had made it and so um, I wanted to do that by the end of the year and I hit that goal in September so <laughs> I'm like okay well this is awesome so then I published two more books the other two books that hadn't sold the agent that was looking at it fell through and I was like, I I like being in control of my career because before I was waiting for someone else to tell me yes, and this was the, this was the first time I could take control and I could say yes, I could make all the shots. No one else could. Yeah, I know, right, CJ, you get it. And so by the end of December of 2010 or 2011, I had four books published and I had sold 26,000 copies. And at that point, and this I tell people I look really stupid when I say this, but I was like, I could actually make money at this. <laughs> like, I just wanted people to read my books. And so that was when I came up with a business plan. And I had joined a KDP Selects because it had unrolled and it had just been um unrolled and I took advantage of their free days and back then it was different. Um you could really bounce back after some free days and um I had hit the top when I hit the top 100 on Amazon in February of 2012, and so it like I sold like 3,000 copies that month. It was like crazy, and so that was kind of like the start of a of my huge career. But you know, I'm not, I can't stick to one genre. I write a lot of genres because I consider myself a storyteller before I consider myself an author. If that sounds strange uh, to me, it's always about the story. I always want to make sure the writing's good, but it's I always want to tell a good story and keep people interested. But the, the fact is, is I can be in control with <laughs> when I self-publish. I have signed with publishers because that's a way for me to get into the print market now. But um, yeah, I will always self-publish. <laughs> I, I, we're, we're control freaks and you'll find that a lot in people that enjoy self-publishing is you totally. love getting your fingers <laughs> dirty and learning yeah. all the ins and outs, you know, even if you don't design your own cover art, you want to know how it's made and, and what works and what doesn't. And even if you don't format, you want to be able to proof it and know that it's the right formatting and how to troubleshoot. So it's it's really a, a great opportunity for people that enjoy learning many ways of doing things. And of course, ER doctor, you know, we're, we're kind of jack of all trades and super control freaks. So it was the perfect thing for me. But I, I've noticed that in a lot of people that enjoy self-publishing is that we are all control freaks. <laughs> can um, can I jump in and just oh, yeah. uh, ask you both <laughs> to expand on that a little bit? Because the idea of being your own boss, it's super empowering. You can be very nimble, it seems like, in ways that you might not be able to with a traditional publisher who will want to keep you doing a certain thing a certain way. Um, but with being your own boss, there are these other responsibilities. It's up to you to find your editor. It's up to you to find your, your cover designer if you, yeah. if you want to hire somebody externally. So I wonder if you could each talk yeah. a little bit about your process for coming up with a plan for success um, using self-publishing. <laughs> Denise is the one with the plan. I just wing it. <laughs> a pantser, I've heard it called. 
See <laughs> your pants? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I have pants. I, I, wait, I think that, uh, <laughs> let me be serious. Yeah. Let, let me be serious for, for one second, though, and, and make something very clear. Because I know a lot of people in the audience are, con are considering traditional publishing or um, self-publishing. And it doesn't have to be an or. It can be an and. And one thing that I always, always want authors right. to keep in mind is that you are CEO of your own global media empire. And it doesn't matter who you partner with. And that's what signing with a traditional publisher is. It's partnering. It's not ceding control. It's not giving up your rights. It's licensing those rights for a certain amount of time. And you expect them to partner with you and provide, you know, some um, goods uh, and some advantages for working with them. And so you can replicate a lot of those advantages by hiring your own team. But it kind of depends on your personality and what works for you. But you are still in charge. Even if you sign a contract with a major New York City publisher, you can't walk away and think they're going to do it all. You're still the boss. So let me just start with that. And then, Denise, you, uh, you're famous for your business plan. So could you talk to those? Because I, I don't plan. I try. But it never, ever works out. So I have no plan. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yeah, when I sold the when I sold all those books and I realized I could be making money, I realized I was a business. And that was really eye-opening to me, that I was a business. So I came up with a 23-page business plan. I looked in the uh, Small Business Association and a couple other places uh, for examples. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I had a marketing plan. I had a production schedule. It was really very eye-opening. Uh, don't laugh at me. <laughs> It was really very eye opening because then oh, I could see I know. Right. Like how many I books I because I, I could see like these books. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was really eye opening because I could see um well and like CJ said, it takes a team. I think it self publishing is a misnomer. Indie indie publishing is better because you can't entirely do this on your own. You just can't. You can't make your own covers, you can't edit your own book. You have to hire an editor to do this. And then, and ideally, you'll have multiple editors. I have a developmental editor. I have a copy editor. I have professional proofreaders, professional formatters, professional cover designers. I have a team. So I'm not really self-publishing. I have a team that I'm like a publisher, but I hire my own people. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so my, so it was really eye opening to me with that mark, with that self pub or with my business plan because then I laid it all out. Like, how much was a book going to cost? How many books did I have to sell to break even? What was my marketing plan for these books? And so it was very eye opening. And every year I set a goal for myself. I, I try to make it high enough so that I have to really stretch to reach it, but it's also not so high that I, that there's no chance. Otherwise you lose hope. But I think it's really important to start thinking of yourself as a business. And then when I did, I had a I had a series that wasn't selling very well. It was a YA series, which typically don't sell well self-published. And I made the decision to make it a two-book series instead of a three-book series. And that was a publisher decision. So I think it's important that you're – I tell people there's two of me. There's the business of Denise Grover Swank and the author Denise Grover Swank. And the business person of Denise Grover Swank, the CEO, sometimes makes decisions that the author doesn't necessarily like because it's – a lot of times it's about sales. Yeah. And, and if that sounds too overwhelming and intimidating for people in the audience, um, there's a really, really good way to kind of – step back and decide what is best for you and what you can handle. And I learned this by reading a business book. Um, it's by Simon Sinek. He also has some great TED Talks called Start With Why. And if you start with your why, and maybe your why is just to get like a memoir out there for your family members to read, and you don't care about turning this into a business then you're going to handle things very differently right. than the way Denise and I do because we're running, like I said, a global multimedia empire. I mean, I have translations all over the world. I have yeah. publishers I partner with all over the world. I'm in, you know, e-books. I, I run my own print publishing company now, Edgy Reads. I'm in audio books. Um, I still partner with New York City on some projects. 
So if that's overwhelming, start with why you're doing this um, and, and what your goal is, just, you know, what, what you want out of it. Do you want to turn it into a business? Are you doing this because you love it and you just want to get your books out there? Then, you know, you're going to take a different path than someone that's coming at it from a career. So don't feel intimidated if that doesn't feel right for you. Uh, you know, start with your why. And that's perfectly legitimate to sit back and say, you know, actually, I just wanted to write a memoir to pass down to my family. That is fine. Get your story out there. This is a wonderful time for readers and writers. It's a renaissance for literature right now. Yeah, it's true. It's a good point. Um, right. For for the folks who are NaNoWriMo winners, um, whom their their why might just be, what am I going to do with this novel that I finished? What's next? And and I wonder if each of you could quickly touch on if you knew right. then what you know now for your first book or early books. Um, what would you be focusing on? You know, if it's if it's if you're if, <laughs> if self-publishing, would you be looking at some uh, you know keywords, book description, cover, editors? You know, what what are the couple of things that you would really be looking at now if you were the person who just finished their first novel? Okay. Denise, you want to start um, Do you want me to go? Yeah, Denise, I would be building my that? social media platform. <laughs> that would be first? <laughs> See, but Denise is very good at social media. I For me, that. I am a hermit. And that would be last. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, see, our like, answers, every, that's a very good case in point, CJ, because what works for one person doesn't work for another. Everyone has their own path. Exactly. 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 And your own, and your own, um, your talent and where your passion lies and where your creativity. Yes. You know, I have friends who are extroverts like Denise and social media sparks their, their creativity and they can write better after they hang out on Facebook. Me, it takes me an hour to figure out a Facebook post because I am a hermit. But I know that about myself <laughs> and I understand it. So for me, I would take the opposite view and my thing I wish I knew, especially those early books, because this really wasn't possible in the you know 2009, early 2010 era of, of KDP. Um, I already had the books professionally edited because they came from a New York City publisher, but I did my own cover or had friends do my covers because it, it just was impossible to go out there and hire a cover artist at that time. And if I was starting out now, I would yeah. I would think, how will my audience find me? And for Denise, it's social media, and I think that's very valid and it's very valuable. If you're good at that, use it. It can be huge. But for me, I would say the package. You know, people don't start buying a book by reading it. They look at the cover. So you have to have that packaging perfect. You have to have whatever they're going to see in the sample, that hook, that opening hook. They have to feel comfortable that you're professional. So your product description has to be able to really convey not the story, but the emotional impact of the story. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would start with if I, and, and I actually about six months after I did start um, with KDP, I redid everything I had. And I redid the uh, covers. I hired, I found a professional <laughs> cover artist that at that time, uh, we were bartering services. I did her editing because I happen to be a pretty good developmental editor. And she did um, my cover graphics for me. So it was a great win-win. And um, that's the way, you know, if you, a lot of people say, I don't have money to hire anyone. You know, you can barter services. I mean, the, that's the cool thing about um, doing something um, like nan, NaNoWriMo is that you form a community and use that community to help each other. Um, you know, you guys touched on something that came up in some of the questions that people were sending in advance around social media. Um, I'm not a gregarious person. I'm shy. I'm very shy. I don't have Facebook. You know, and it's and it's really you know, for a lot of writers, we're we're misfits, right? We're, we don't we don't we're not great at being out there and selling ourselves. And so I think that's a question that a lot of people have um, is 
later, how do I reach my audience in a way that feels natural? Um, I sort of know I need to use social media. I don't feel I'm good at it. Any tips on, on sort of finding your place in that world? Because you both, you know, you're both out there. You're both very good at it, even though you say you're not, CJ. You're, you're, you, you have both found a way to connect with your readers in impressive ways. So how do you get uh, comfortable? For me, I'll that? start. You want to take one? You're, you're... I love. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just, I mean, I have 4,100 friends, friends now. I don't know how I know most of them. Uh, I think most of them are readers, but I, I like, I like to tell stories about my life. I tell them stories about my kids. I, like I told a story about dropping my kids off at school yesterday and telling them to have a magical day and asking them if they remembered their magic wand, their wizarding wand. Well, they think I'm crazy. I mean, that's kind of my – I'm goofing around with my kids all the time. So I'm all the time telling things about my kids. I don't know what I'm going to do when they grow up because I don't know what I'll talk about. Maybe my dogs. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'll have grandkids then. But my readers tell me that they feel like they know me. They feel like they, uh, I'm a friend. They, they, I've had people come to signings and say they, I've never seen their name in comments or anything. And they say they follow me on Facebook and they like to read my posts. So at least I know somebody's like listening to or reading what I'm saying, but it's a chance for me to connect with my readers. And I really do love connecting with my readers. So. <laughs> I just, I don't know. It's like, so it's, it's a chance for them to get a, I've, I've had a lot of people who friended me and were friends with me on Facebook for a year before they ever bought or read my first book. And, um, they said, and it's not because, and that's another thing is don't get on there and say, Hey, buy my book. Here's my book. They're, you're going to turn people off. It's not sell. It's not sell my book media. It's social media. So you're supposed to be there and, and talk to people, like relate to them as, as people. And they're going to care about you. So then they're going to get excited about your books and if you're doing well and, you know, what's going on. So. Okay. Now, and see, I have, I think, four friends. <laughs> but, again, I'm a very <laughs> private person. So my Facebook, and yeah, see, now she's laughing. My Facebook profile is private, and I do everything on a fan page, which is set up for reader interaction. Yeah. And so people come there knowing it's about my book, um, and it's about my fans. I mean, I love it when my fans right. post on there. I often, right. I post sporadically, like, I don't know, once or twice a week. I mean, seriously, very little. Um, but, you know, I'll throw up something that, it, you know, like a quote or, or, hey, has anyone seen a good movie or what have you, because I do enjoy interacting with my fans. It's just I'm not social and I'm not that comfortable with media, so it's not my primary place. I think I have, like, I don't know, close to 10,000 followers on the fan page, but, of course, the way Facebook works, you know, very, very few of them ever see any of my posts. Right. Um, I primarily, my biggest marketing thing for people to really get to know me and understand me is to write the next book. I mean, seriously. I mean, that's, you know, that's where a lot of the fan mail comes from. Oh, my God, I read this book and it changed my life. You know, people get really um, excited when you have a new book out. So I write the next book. I really would say, honestly, that's your best marketing strategy. And if we have time later on talking about how to build a career, we can discuss that more. And then the other key thing, and this is something I started very early on, is I began a newsletter. Because once a month, chatting with people yes. by writing a little letter, I can handle that because I keep them very short. And I always try to give some kind of added value. It's not always about me and my books. I invite other authors um, to, to come and do interviews or uh, I've done like video chats with like Lee Child and Tess Garrison and Lisa Gardner and shared those through my newsletter. So, um, you know, I just, uh, I think you have to find what you're comfortable with because if you're forcing it, then yes. you're going to not be as creative and not have as much energy to go back and write. And that's really the bottom line is getting the words on the page. That's great. Great. So I, I think what we want to do next is start to get to some of the viewers' questions. I think uh, Grant from NaNoWriMo is going to join us again in a second. Um, and I'll let him take over and start um, start. There he is. Hey, 
Grant. processing some of these questions. Hi, Grant. Welcome back. Hello. Hey, everyone. I've been uh, writing lots of notes during this. Um, I've learned so much, and I, I, I love uh, both of your messages to on that leap from being an author to kind of thinking of yourself as a be as a as a business and and being a CEO of that business. And um, and and Denise, I love your phrase, putting yourself in the publisher role to make this decisions the author might not like. I think that's a fascinating concept. Um, but let's jump into these uh, these questions from our our, our viewers. Um, Tim Kim, who's currently dressed in a bear camp uh, for a, for a, a Camp NaNoWriMo uh, photo shoot, is queuing these up. So just picture him in a bear suit uh, doing this. Uh, first question: How do I find? <laughs> Sorry for the time lag. People laugh afterward. How do I find the right person to help me edit and perfect my manuscript? I think this is a big question. You know, it's a it's a big investment. And how do you how do you go about finding that perfect editor? CJ, do you want to start? Sure, trial and error. Um, <laughs> it's really hard. I, we're talking developmental editor. Copy editors are a little bit um, more objective to measure when you find a good one. There's two things that people always bring up when they're talking about finding editors. First of all, they say, I don't have any money. Well, it doesn't matter. You still need someone to edit. And um, I would start with what um, Denise and I probably call beta readers or critique partners can actually work as very nice developmental editors. If you pick one to understand and know your genre, uh, whenever you're doing anything in this business, uh, for me at least, it always has to start with the audience because this is a business for me. So we've gone past the artistic, Oh, my manuscript's my precious baby stage. No, we're past that. Now it is a commodity. It's a product that we have to develop and perfect because yes. people are going to be spending money and worth some money time on this. I mean, it takes, what, eight to ten hours to read a book? Right. That's a serious time commitment. I mean, that's an entire season of binge watching, um, you know, a series on Netflix, right? So, I mean, this is a commitment. So you have to have that product really polished. Um, there are places you can go to hire uh, editors um, because a lot of it depends on your genre. Nonfiction versus fiction, thriller versus romance, very, very different as far as what you need and look for in an editor. Uh, Readsy, R-E-E-D-S-Y, has a nice platform um, with, you know, you can see how much people charge. You can ask them to do a sample page. Um, I'd recommend probably at least having a discussion before you hire a developmental editor. Uh, all the ones I've hired are people that I've worked with and that have worked with New York City Publishing. So I already knew their style. And even then, as my books, because I'm kind of like Denise, I don't stay on one genre. I created my own genre because I'm too ADD to stick with just one, one narrow subsection. Uh, sometimes I've had to move on. Uh, because, you know, my needs have, have evolved past theirs. So it, it very much is a trial and error uh, thing, but you really need one. It's not something – that's actually my most expensive part of my book production process is the editorial. I, I spend more money on that than I do on anything else, um, including even the audio yeah. narration. So, yeah, don't yes. skimp on that. But keep keep yeah. trying. If you don't find someone you click with – don't feel like you are their servant, that you must do what they say. It's your book. You know what right. you want to convey to the audience. You know, you have to you have to stand up for it. No one's gonna care about that book as much as you do. No agent, no publisher, no editor. So start there, start with knowing your audience and what's gonna make them just be delighted and jump for joy. That's Denise, that's my business plan. How can I make my readers jump for joy? That's my business plan. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. I think that's yeah, I would say, like, if you're just, a like, a lot of man. the viewers, yeah, the view, yeah, <laughs> I think a lot of the viewers are probably, like, maybe in the very beginning stages, they finish their first book, or, or maybe their second, and they're, like, they're clueless. There's a lot of Facebook groups for authors. Just kind of start searching for, like, your genre and maybe put author in there. There's also, like, Yahoo um, list groups. For authors in different genres, um, the best resource is to get 
to ask other authors who they use. Are they happy? Read their books. Do you like their books? Are you like, wow, that was really dumb? Well, that's probably not the developmental editor for you, although they may not have taken that development out of developmental editor's advice. But yeah, in the beginning, I used beta readers and critique partners to help me with that before. I, I wrote a couple books before I had a development editor, but I also trusted them. A couple of them were authors, so they knew what they were talking about. If you're just getting readers, a lot of them are just gonna say, oh yeah, it's really great. They don't know. I mean, they don't know what didn't work or whatever. So just kind of use your judgment on that. But editing is so important. Because if you don't get it right, if someone reads your first book or a book of you and it's really badly written, they will look at your books in the future and say, oh, that person can't write. I'm never re reading another book of theirs. So you want to you wanna get it right the first time so that they, they don't you know, tell everyone about how bad you are. Well, and I think that, that brings up another question. Should you publish your first book? Well, I was just going to say that that brings up another question. Should you actually publish your first book? You know, I, I, I finished. I, I won Nano um, Rimo. I can never say that word right. <laughs> and, um, you know, should I go ahead and publish this? And honestly, people <laughs> hate to hear this, but my advice is if you want to turn this into a career, if you want to be a professional author and be doing this for years and be gathering readers for years, you don't look at it from the point of view of, I finished a book, I want to publish it. You look at it from the point of view of, how does a reader approach a book? There's nothing worse as a reader, for me, than getting to the end of the book, and I can't buy any more books from that author. You know, I might go to their website, and they say, oh, coming soon, I'm working on this new book. Especially if they're self-published, and it's under their control, you should wait. Honestly, I know no one wants to hear that. We're all impatient, but you should wait. I would say if you have at least three or four books ready to go in the same genre, aimed at the same audience, that way they are happy because they can click the buy next button and you're happy because you're going to be making a lot more money and a lot more sales. And that synergy just builds on each other. And Denise, I know you found this with your series, with the Rose series, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't until the I, third book I, that it really you, started like oh, snowballing and selling. Yeah. 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 It's amazing how that synergy works. So, you yeah. know, I know no one wants to hear that, but I would, I would say wait. You've definitely got a business plan, CJ. I don't believe you. <laughs> that sounds like a business plan to me. <laughs> See? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good one. Let's go at that. This is the classic question, this next class question. Um, we get asked this so many times. Um, what should be the main factor in deciding whether to self-publish or seek traditional publishing? What do you think? You guys have both had different mm -hmm. pathways. <laughs> Did you want to start with this one, Denise? Kind of answered it earlier when you talked about um, jumping into self-publishing and it opening the door to traditional yeah some of it is control like i realize now that i have have taken offers from from you know publishers that some things i don't have any control over um you know i I can fight back, but some things that they can just say, no, nope, that's the way it's going to be. Um, but the, the one good thing about that is they have their own cover designers, they have their own editors, they have their own proofreaders or formatters. So if you're like, if you don't want to have to deal with all that, you don't want to find and build your team, then that's probably the way to go. But honestly, you're probably not going to make as much money that way. But some people are okay with that. But I will say that it's a lot harder to find an audience now as an indie author than it was when CJ and I started. There weren't a lot out there. People didn't even know what an indie author was. They just were looking for books. And so, um, and indie authors typically price their books um, more inexpensively than New York. So we were getting readers just because um, they were all had brand new Kindles and they were looking to read books. But there's a lot of books out there now, and so it's really hard to find an audience. And so, um, but at the same time, unless a New York, 
a New York deal may not even find you an audience either. So um, I think it, a lot of it depends on how much control you want to have over your career and, and over your books. CJ, anything to add? I totally agree with, yeah, I totally, totally agree with what Denise said. I mean, that is really important. And it goes back to what I said earlier. Start with your why. Um, if you're writing a nonfiction that, you know, uh, really, you know, would best serve your audience by being produced by a traditional publisher, perhaps an academic press or a small press, um, you know, then that route probably is the better way to go. However, I mean, I know a lot of nonfiction um, authors that are entrepreneurs, and they use their book as like a virtual business card to actually bring in more money and more audience through their workshops and you know webinars and live appearances. So you have to understand what your why is. You know, why are you doing this? What's your goal? Also, your time frame. Um, having them published both ways, and Denise can speak to this as well, New York City works so much slower <laughs> than any other form of publishing. I mean, if you don't need any money for the next two to three years, then okay, no big deal. But if you're looking you know, to build a career now and you really want to get it rolling, then you, know, you might be better served by considering indie publishing. So you have to really understand why you're doing this and what your goals are. Mm -hmm. Those are great answers. Thanks so much. Here we go to um, an, one more question here. What ways can you market your book on a shoestring budget? You guys talked uh, about marketing earlier, but do you have anything <laughs> to add, especially for those who might not have a, mon a lot of money to invest in fancy book cover designs and things like that? Well, I, I, I a book cover doesn't have to cost you a lot of money. I mean, it's you know, so again, it goes back to uh, putting the whole package together. But I, I always tell people my number one marketing tool is sitting down and writing the next book, and that doesn't cost anything. I mean, you know, that's how that's how the magic really happens. Just like Denise mentioned, is getting more books out there, getting more audience hooked, and uh, telling their friends and and getting that word of mouth. And of course, you know what Denise does on social media, that's free, right? Denise, do you pay for any of your social media, like Facebook oh, yeah. ads or anything like that? I haven't I jumped just, into any kind of paid I just yet, started so. Facebook ads. Yeah, okay. I just started using paid Facebook ads. So, yeah, I mean, I don't, now everybody's doing it, so I feel like it's already getting saturated. But if I could jump in yeah, real quick. Yeah. So I mean, you know, yeah, I don't no, I don't yeah. really pay for marketing. Sure, Neil, go so. for it. Yeah, I just think um I forget if it was CJ or Denise earlier mentioned what a great time it is to be an author. Um and I think one reason for that is that there is a lot of there are a lot of tools and and um options out there for you to find your readers that didn't exist when I started writing books. Um you know, and and you really can do it on a right. shoestring uh, for free to for starters. You know, not just social media, Twitter and Facebook, yeah. but you know, Amazon's got some some yeah. tools that you can use. You can set up your own author page. You can encourage uh, readers to follow you on Amazon. You can link your blog to your Amazon page. Um, you, if you're in KDP Select, there are tools and, and programs you can use like countdown deals and, and free giveaways and, and Kindle Unlimited. So they, there are all these these uh, abilities out there now that uh, you, you can use to market your book that just didn't exist just a couple of years ago. So I think it's it's an exciting time and you really can come up with a shoestring budget to um, to get your book out there. I, I I totally agree with that. But I would put out a warning. A warning. There are a lot of people out there that are creating services that are really just ripping off authors. Because they, I mean, Kindle's gone from what a million right. books in 2011 to almost four million now, five years later. So that's you know a couple million authors of. Of course, people are going to want to be making money off of us. So, you know, again, I think it's 
and this is where having a, a business plan like what Denise said could be very helpful, is to be very clear if you're partnering with someone and you're paying them to do something, what you expect, what you're paying them for, and make certain right. that you hold them accountable. Because I, I don't know about you, Denise, I've heard of so many nightmares of people getting ripped off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for me, um, one very effective way to get marketing is to put a book for sale or put it put it for free for a short period of time, which you can do with um, KDP when you enroll in Select. You can, I think, you get five free days, and then in conjunction, run some ads with that so that people right. notice that your book is free. It works best if you have at least two more books in the series because then they will sell, they, you will have sell through. So it makes a lot of people really are reluctant to put a first book of a series for free. But the sell through is often very incredible and pays for the difference. Um, the sales of the next, the subsequent books of the series makes it well worth both the ads and putting the book for free. Yeah. yeah good point. Great. Thanks. I was going to chime in, CJ, when you were mentioning that um, people getting taken advantage of. Um, there's a great website, Predators. I think it's called Predators and Editors um, or something like that. Maybe Tim yeah, can put yeah. the link up, but it's a good yeah. place to screen uh, services like that. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. going on to the next question here, uh, what is the best way to go about getting some reviews for Kindle or Goodreads? Do you guys, how do you do that, especially initially? <laughs> you want to take that one, CJ? <laughs> you want to start off? <laughs> CJ, you jump in. Sorry. I, I, um, yeah, no, I, I, um, I put a, a note at the end of the book saying, hey, you made it this far. If you enjoyed it, please leave a review. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of people just don't even realize how much as authors we want to hear their opinion and we really appreciate it. Um, it's something um, right. in my newsletter, you know, I often, not every newsletter, but, you know, once or twice a year, I'll remind people that, hey, you know, such and such a book doesn't quite have the number of reviews that the other books do. Someone want to show it some love? I mean, you know, um, I, I I don't know of any real, because you want authentic reviews. I mean, don't go buy them on Fiverr or something. I mean, you want real reviews. Right. and. Real readers yeah. usually love the, yeah. the opportunity to share their opinion. Right. Do you ask yeah, I'll ask on review? Facebook. Like, I'll say, you know, this book doesn't. Uh, I don't. Not anymore. I've heard, too, that um, giveaways Facebook usually can really figures out. Or yeah. Amazon usually figures out. Have you guys used giveaways, uh, either yeah. the free day I'll give Kindle, away, yeah, I'll give away coffee. or Goodreads, yeah. and then encourage people to review yeah. what they've received? Yeah, I'll, I'll give away copies on Facebook. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give, I'll give away copies on Facebook yeah, to, I, I or in my newsletter um, and say, you know, in exchange for the copy, yeah, an honest review. And I stress honest review. That's how traditional publishing companies work. They send out, you know, hundreds to thousands of copies of advanced readers' copies, either electronically or physical copies. So I, I think, you know, using our readers the same way, it makes perfect sense to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This next question again uh, touches on some marketing issues. And I think some some words like author brand and author platform uh, that people are always interested in and have different definitions. <laughs> How do you go about defining your author brand or your author persona? You guys seem so natural at this that you're just who you are. But do you do you think of an author brand? Do you want to start, CJ? You and your business plan? Yeah, I, I actually <laughs> this is the one area of business that I I actually feel very comfortable with. Um, I actually teach this. I, I help people like um, Joanna Penn, who's wonderful. You guys might know her from her blog, thecreativepen.com. Fantastic brand for her nonfiction. 
and she needed a little help defining her author brand for her fiction. Uh, so we brainstormed some ideas. But I, I love author branding, and here's the reason why. You can't think of it as author branding like, you know, um, oh, I want a logo, oh, I want a typeface, oh, I want a color. What you're really conveying with your author brand is you're making a promise. A book from C.J. Lyons promises this experience. And it's an emotional promise. Um, and so then you build in the other details, you know, what color your website is or your cover art or what font your name is in after that. But you have, to, and again, it goes back to starting with why. You have to understand, why am I writing this kind of book? Uh, for me, um, I knew I didn't want to be pigeonholed as a medical thriller doctor. So, um, or author. So what I did was I created my own brand, of Thrillers with Heart, because my books are very character driven. There's always this emotional honesty uh, that's unveiled um, and is kind of the primal heart of each novel. So that has become my brand. And even though I've branched into YA, I've done some romantic thrillers. Uh, I've done the Shadow Ops series, which is Covert Ops. I've done my FBI thrillers, as well as my medical thrillers, uh, even some science fiction. Uh, they all come in under that same umbrella of they are all thrillers of heart, and they achieve that promise to the audience. Um, now, author platform to me, and Denise, let me know if you have a different definition, but to me, that's just the number of people that are aware of your brand whether they're people that read your blog or people that read your newsletter or your Facebook page or your Twitter account. They're just basically the audience you can readily quantify. Um, and there's a lot of tools to quantify that to understand your demographics. Like I can give you the demographics of the majority of my readers, um, but that's not really my brand. My brand is the emotional promise that I'm making with every single book I put out there. Right. Yeah. Anything to add? Yeah, I think I think you need to look at what stories you're writing, and you know what what are the emotional connections that the readers are going to have to your books because they have to form a emotional connection or they're not going to remember your book and you want them to remember your book so they'll buy more. Yeah. And mine is like yeah. uh, to mine is like normal people thrust in situations that are difficult and there's often very well developed secondary characters and secondary relationships in the books. And I often have a lot of um, secondary, I focus a lot on uh, relationships even in my romances with secondary female characters. And so my readers really love that. Now do I have like words to put that into a description? I, I don't. I know a lot of authors like will give like three words to describe. There's I just know what I am, and I probably could be better at like naming my author brand, <laughs> but it works for me so far, so I'm just going with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. I think we'll take one more question here and then and then wrap up because we're heading towards two o'clock. Uh, I'd love to keep talking for an hour, but um, I know you guys have other things to do. Uh, this is like the classic author question. How do you know when your novel is ready to be published? Are you tempted to continue tinkering? <laughs> I'm always tempted to tinker for like another two or three years. <laughs> what do you think, Denise? Um, well, I, I think it's really important that you've had other people read it. Then they, you know, if you get a lot of positive feedback, then it probably is close to being ready, like there's no, your book's never going to be perfect and that was really hard for me to accept. It's going to be really close. I had a book that I just turned into my editor um, my, for copy editing today and I went through it three times and I kept changing things and I'm like, okay, it's done, it's done, just let it go. You know? So um, I, a lot of that, it helps if you have an editor, a professional who knows and they will tell you, this isn't ready, you need to work on this or whatever. Um, and then if, you know, you, and that's a lot of building that relationship with an editor that you trust. It's really important to trust your editor because then, you know, they're like that buffer between you and the public and bad reviews. So, you know, you have to trust their opinion.
What do you think, CJ? Um, <clears throat> this is like the hardest question for me because I know the first draft of any novel is is me having fun and discovering the story because I don't outline, I don't plot ahead of time. So I'm if I'm surprised, I figure the reader will be surprised. So I'm happy because I told the story I wanted to tell with that first draft. But I know that if I want to sell the story, if I want to ask other people to invest their time and their money in it, then you know I need to make it even better. So I kind of turn off you know, one section of, you know, is the story ready to be published? It's the story I wanted to tell. And then I have to change gears to the actual revising. And I have a bit of ADD. I get bored very easily. So I actually can't go through very many revisions without getting so sick of a story that I just never want to look at it again. So I, I, I agree with Denise, working and getting feedback from my developmental editors is really important. Um, I'm lucky enough, though, I just finished my 31st or 32nd story that I'm at the point now where after the first draft, I usually, if I just let it sit for a little while, and Stephen King advises this as well. He says, give it six weeks in a drawer to ferment, kind of like a good wine. You know, it takes time. Then you can come back with fresh eyes. And a lot of times that revision process is so much easier because I can go, oh, of course, I need to do this, or I need to do this, or I didn't set this up. And usually the ready to be published isn't driven by when I'm ready, it's driven by my deadline, you know, because my, my copy editors, I can only use them and book them when they're free. Um, if I set up a pre-order, then I have a publishing deadline, even if it's a self-published book, I still have that deadline, I have to get the book done. So. I'm very deadline driven. It's not, I don't have the luxury of sitting and playing and going back and teasing out the nuances. And um, quite frankly, I don't have the patience to do so. Thanks so much. I think if we could sign off, if everyone could say like one sentence or two of parting advice that will empower people after this, this webinar to finish their novels and think about publishing them. I'm going to start off. Um, I think everyone should, you guys mentioned community several times, whether it's to find beta readers or get advice. And so I'm going to advise people to go into the NaNoWriMo forums. They're open year round. We have a whole, I wrote a novel, now what section? So you can, can connect with your fellow writers, ask them questions, and, and, and keep that energy going, whether it's encouragement you need or, or a beta reader or advice on publishing. I'm going to go up to Neil, since he hasn't been on screen for a while. Neil, do you have any parting advice? <laughs> um, I do have advice, and it's just keep writing. You know, uh, every day if possible, even if it's just for 15, 20 minutes, it's... Um, it's hugely important to, to stay committed to it, whatever stage of the process you're at, keep going, don't give up. Um, uh, you know, an hour a day can lead to a book in no time. Mm -hmm. Exactly, great. How about you, Denise? Um, I agree with both of you guys. I think writing is so solitary that it's really important to find a group of people. And mine are online. Most of my people are online at the same level as you are. So you guys can cheer each other on and understand each other's frustrations. But the writing is so important. You have to keep writing. That's why I love NaNoWriMo because it, it builds that habit of writing every day. And if you're not writing, it feels weird that there's something missing, that you're not doing something you're supposed to be doing. So without the writing, there's nothing. And the when you hit those really low, you know, valleys, having that writer's community is really going to help you get through that. So I cheated. <laughs> hey. CJ, the finale is in your hands. Leave us yeah, with some great no. Okay. So I'm gonna say. <laughs> Yes to all of the above, and not just writing, but reading. Read, read, read. Immerse yourself in yes. wonderful storytelling, but also read stuff that you would hate or that you would never read. 
figure out what works for you and what doesn't, because a lot of times that will also work for your audience. Um, what, what kind of tropes are coming up? What kind of things really inspire your audience and that you want to try to add to your own work? My agent um, has a rule, so I'm going to give you it. This is her magic rule. So, you know, this is her way to success. Write 2K a day and read 2K a day at least. So that's a good rule of thumb. It's the Powell rule. Write 2K, read 2K. I like it. You did it, CJ. The finale. That was the perfect ending. <laughs> 2,000 to write, 2,000 to read. So, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thanks again for, for thanks again for all the wonderful advice you guys have given. I'm, I know I'm leaving inspired, and I'm sure our viewers are as well. And just to remind the viewers that this this uh, webcast is archived forever. So uh, please uh, tweet it so your friends know about it. And you can always come back and watch it if there's something you want to uh, to uh, hear or review. So once again, thanks to Kindle Direct Publishing for sponsoring this and making this happen. And thanks for all of you for showing up with such generous advice. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks, Brent. I didn't thanks for inviting us. It's been great. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you.